Um, hopefully you've been tracking with us. We are doing a series focusing on movies that are out in the theaters right now and grabbing onto some stuff to see what we can take from the movie that God might have something to say about. So this week was Dark Phoenix. So the movie's been out for a week and a half. So if you didn't go yet and I spoil it for you, it's your own fault. You had plenty of opportunity. Uh, it's a pretty good show. It's an X-Men show. So if you've tracked with X-Men, you start to follow it. Um, if you don't, which I haven't, I understood it. There's some good themes in there. I'm going to give you a little scenario about what happens in the movie, and then we'll jump into some stuff. So Jean Grey is the main character, and she has this power that she's had since she was a little girl. It was a misunderstood power like all the X-Men. That's kind of the history is that they have this misunderstood power. And not only was her power misunderstood, but she didn't know how to manage it well as a young girl. She mismanaged her power. And so there was this tragic thing that happened when she was a little girl that involved a car accident that she sort of caused accidentally. And it ended up taking the life of her mother. And she thought it took the life of her father. In the movie, you find out that it actually didn't, but that was all hidden from her. Because her father didn't know how to handle her, because she didn't know how to handle this power that was within her, he schlepped her off onto the X-Men school, and that became her family. So she was raised with the X-Men, and she learned how to harness this power that she didn't know how to manage well. She learned how to manage it well. Fast forward, she grows up. She's on the X-Men team, and there's a space shuttle mission that goes into space, and there's this weird space anomaly. They think it's like a solar flare that causes the space shuttle to go out of trajectory, and it's just spinning. So the X-Men, because now at this phase of the X-Men, they're the heroes of the world. They go out to save the crew of the space shuttle before the space shuttle is destroyed. So this weird energy force, it's not a solar flare, it's this big energy force is up there. And so they go in and they rescue the crew. They come back and they realize the commander is not rescued yet. So they go back in their supernatural ways to go back. And Gene is the one that has the power to hold the space shuttle together in the midst of it blowing into pieces because that's her power. So she's in there trying to keep everything together. They rescue the last guy. And then this weird space anomaly power source subsumes her. It just goes and goes inside of her very graphically. And she does not die. So now she has even more power than she's ever had. And she's all good. She can, like, breathe in space and everything because she's just floating out there. They bring her back in. She goes back to the earth, and she just feels really good. Um, this power just feels really good inside of her, and she's doing good. And then all of a sudden, she's not doing good. These things start to happen like what happened when she was a young girl. She starts to lose control of this new superpower that's inside of her. And the same things start to happen. She loses control, and she starts to hurt people around her. She starts to destroy things around her, and she actually starts to hurt people that she loves and cares about, and she ends up killing her best friend. And then she, because she doesn't know how to control the power, she doesn't want to be around anyone because she breaks things and destroys people, so she leaves. But then there's, of course, aliens involved because it is an X-Men kind of thing. And so aliens have been hovering around this force out in space for a long, long time because this force, this creative universe energy destroyed their planet I don't know how long ago, and all the inhabitants, except for a few of them, who are following and tracking. So they see this whole subsuming thing take place. This power source goes into Jean. It destroys everything, but it didn't destroy her, so they want her. So the aliens come to Earth, and the battle ensues where they're trying to capture Jean or convince her for her to use her power for them or just to give them her power. And that's how the whole movie plot starts to go. I'll come back to it at the end on how it ends. But there's this really good quote. When the screen was still black before they even showed any of the action, I got a quote that I was going to use for the message today. So I could have got up and left, but I wanted to get my money's worth, so I stayed. Here's the quote. It says, everyone fights to evolve into something better. I love that quote. I think it's a great quote. Don't get all upset because I use the word evolve in church. Uh, you can use it in church for other ways, and that's what this way is. It's turning into something better and something bigger. That's kind of a, a church concept. We call it sanctification. That's kind of church speak. That we believe that as we are transformed by Jesus Christ, we become more and more like him. We're turned into his likeness. That's what we call sanctification. That's why I love the quote. I need that help. I need to be turned more and more into Jesus. He's definitely bigger and definitely better than me. So I like the quote. 
but I just don't think that's how the movie goes. I think it was probably a wrong quote, at, you know, because I'm such a screenwriter and everything. It was the wrong quote for the movie. I came up with a different one. And here's my quote. This is what I think the movie was really about. Everyone fights not to evolve into something worse. That's really what the movie was about. She had this power inside of her, and she was trying not to evolve into something worse. Unfortunately for me, and probably unfortunately for you, I can relate a little bit more to this one instead. Even the best of us have what I'm calling this morning a shadowy side. We have these shadowy sides of us that lurk within us, that come out and make us do things that we don't want to do to people that we don't want to do them to. I can verify that. I've done that. I can testify that. I can tell you stories when the shadowy side of me has come out and caused me to do things that I knew I really didn't want to do, but I did anyway, and it hurt people that I didn't want to hurt. And if it wasn't for this sanctification thing that I talked about, this pursuing Jesus part of my life, my shadowy side would have overtaken my life in some areas that Jesus interrupted and has transformed me. So I definitely have a shadowy side. Um, some of the, those little shadowy sides are just kind of weird. Um, I'm kind of weird, so it would be consistent that my shadowy side would be kind of weird. Some of them are run-of-the-mill, medium-grade uh, bad things. Some of them are not medium-grade at all. Some of them are pretty dark, pretty shadowy, pretty black, and those things live in me. I don't think I'm that unique. In fact, I know some of your stories. I know that you have those shadowy things as well. And we're going to talk about that today. I, I even have a story about a church person. This, this guy that led churches in the United States, he started a church, and he created a movement with his church. One church became another church, which became another church. It became this large chain of churches that were impacting lives, that were changing people's lives, a movement of churches. Well, I read this article where he recently lost his position as the leader of this movement and the leader of his church because of some marginal leadership issues. And then there was this investigation that just came out. In this uh, investigation, apparently, he looked into hiring a hitman. You know what hitmen do? They kill people. He hired a pastor, a good pastor, looked into hiring a hitman to kill his son-in-law, who was giving his daughter some bad times, and then also looked into offing his arch rival in ministry. A pastor, isn't that a, pa a guy who's doing good stuff for the church, for the kingdom, for people in the United States and around the world. He had this dark side, the shadowy side that got the best of him. How does this happen? How does it happen? Well, it's not that hard to figure out. There's one verse that I want to read to you from Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. It's kind of our theme verse for the day. This is what it says. <clears throat> for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit... And the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh, they are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that you love us in spite of our shadowy side. But we thank you that you didn't leave us to just contend with our shadowy side alone. We thank you, Jesus, that you want to sanctify us, that you want to continue to transform us into your likeness, which is a good and grand and better likeness. So regardless of what um, we're thinking about in our shadowy side, Jesus, we pray that you would help us to know what to do with the shadowy side and mostly that we would know what to do with you in our life. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. So we have a dilemma and we have a challenge. Here's the dilemma and the challenge. Both good and bad live in us. Both are fighting for domination and you are the one who empowers the victor. You actually get to decide which side of you is going to win, the good side or the bad side of you. I don't have to convince you of this, do I? You're, you're already pondering, probably not yourself, but the dark sides, the shadowy sides of people around you, and probably yourself as well. The risk of today is that that's all you're going to think about from here on out this morning. So let's, let's try to put a pause on that, and let's think about sanctification, being more like Christ. And then it's also, let's consider that you're not alone, that if, as you read in the Bible, there's all kinds of stories. In fact, all of the people, all the biggies in the Bible have this dark side in them. The Bible is full of shadowy sides of people that contemplate doing the right thing but are drawn to doing the bad thing, the wrong thing, and that's what gets the upper hand in their life. I would even say, you ready for this? Put your little church seatbelts on. 
Jesus even had a shadowy side. Jesus? Jesus had a shadowy side? I think he did. He was tempted. He really was tempted. We're going to talk about some of that. But he was, did the coolest thing ever with temptation because he, he empowered the victory that overcame temptation, that overcame sin. Sinlessness was the victor when it came to Jesus. He was the only one that's ever done it. But he had a shadowy side. I can think of four instances in the New Testament right off the bat where we could see a shadowy side. The last one is when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember if you've read that story? He knew what he was about to do. He was going to go suffer for you. He was going to die on the cross for me because of my shadowy side that overtakes me all too often. He died for that. He was going to die for that. He's in the garden praying to God the Father and said, hey, you know, this whole salvation for humanity thing, if there's a way for it not to take place, can we do it that way instead? Because I don't know that I want to go through all of this. And there wasn't another way. So he said, all righty then. I'm pretty sure that's what he said. All righty then, let's just go to the cross and take care of this sin problem. So he had this moment where the shadowy side was saying, yeah, maybe you don't have to do this. But he withstood that temptation. Also, we um, can see in the New Testament that he was tempted by Satan. I'm going to read about that in a second. But you know, I got to pause for a second. I get so geeked out sometimes by the Bible. I, I love it. I get so excited. This is one of those weeks I got so excited because... Did you know that as we look at the way Jesus was tempted in just a moment in the book of Matthew chapter 4, he was tempted in three areas. If you go to the beginning of the story, which I like to go to a lot in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve were tempted, it was the same three areas. And then when you go to the end of the Bible in 1 John, we're told about the shadowy side of humanity and how we're tempted to sin in three areas. The reason I get so geeked out is they're all same, the, the same areas. We think that we're all sophisticated as people. When it comes to sin, we are kind of sophisticated in the ways that we do sin, the way we come up with ways to sin, and even more sophisticated in the ways we try to cover up our sin. But when it comes to the area of temptation, there's three basic areas, period. I, um, I studied it this week. I got so excited. Um, so I have this little notebook here. Do um, you see these pens? They're like colored pens. So I was studying Genesis and 1 John and Matthew, and like I, I made this chart that has multiple colors because I was going to make this great slide for you so you could fill in the chart. And I realized that that was uh, probably a little too geeky and a little bit too sophisticated. Not that I'm sophisticated, a little complicated. I just want to keep it simple. So if you want the chart, I tried to explain it to someone after the first service, and it, it wasn't helpful to them, and they were geeky too. So this wasn't the way to go. We're going to keep it simple today, and I'm going to just read the three occurrences of that happening, and then I'm going to tell you what I think they are, the way that I think of those three areas of the dark side of the um, shadowy side of us. So the first one is Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. Three areas. Good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom. Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 11, the temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point in the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Number three, the devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels attended him. 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So those are the three things. Like I said, I spent some time, I got all geeked out and excited about it because it's not that sophisticated. We're not all that we think we are. There's just basic ways 
that, that we are enticed into giving our life in the moment to the shadowy side. So I'm going to tell you how I summarize them. The first one. There are three shadowy sides fighting for domination. The first one is identity. The first one is identity. I want to prove that I exist. I want to prove that I exist. So all of us want to know who we are. Tina and I were watching uh, America's Got Talent, AGT, this last week. And it was so funny when they do the little interviews for the, of the people who are going to perform that or what they're going to perform. All of them say something like this. I exist to be a singer. I was born to be a comedian. I exist to be a slinger of knives at moving people. Whatever it is that they do, that's what they exist for. They've come to know who they are, and it's that thing. I've wrestled with my identity even as a pastor. There were some days uh, years and years ago where I was struggling in my church, and I wondered if I should be there, but I was pretty sure that I existed to be a pastor, and if I wasn't a pastor, who was I? We all wrestle with that kind of identity. We all want to know who we are, and we all fight to try to figure, out, figure what that is if we don't know what it is. So that's the first one. It's identity. The second one is significance. I want to prove that I matter. None of us want to live without some sort of point to living. So it's not only that we want to know that we exist, that we exist, we want to know why we exist. I think one of the biggest fears of humanity is that when we do die, that the little dash on our headstone is just that, just a dash, that we didn't amount to anything that's significant, that we didn't make any contributions, that no one's going to remember what we did in our life and for other people around us, and that the only thing that will outlast us is a little bit of our DNA. That's not what we want. We want to know that we matter. We long for significance. And the third one is pleasure. I want my feelings to matter. So this temptation is seated in sensuality or getting pleasure. So you might say, why am I attaching emotions to it? Because in sensuality, when we seek out things, it's because they make us feel a certain way. And that's why we seek them out in the moment. All of us have done things in the moment that later on we thought, why did we do that? That is destructive to me. That is destructive to people that I care about. But in the moment... It felt good, or it felt safe, or it felt secure, or it made me feel powerful, or it made me feel accepted, or it made me feel, and you fill in the blank with how it made you feel. So that's the third area. So we want some identity, we want some significance, and we want some pleasure. And if those things aren't coming, our shadowy side starts to get the best of us. So I get pretty excited about that information. Like I said, I know that I'm a, a geek that way, but to me it's so simple that that can start to manage. But knowing something is not enough. What do we do with this knowledge? So that's what I want to talk about now. So when we see the shadowy side of our lives start to take, overtake moments in our life, what do we do? How do we manage the battle? If this battle in Galatians 5.17 is taking place in us, how do we let the better side of us, the Jesus-like side of us, have victory? So I have four things that I think will help. First one, how can we manage the battle is watch for your shadowy self. Watch for your shadowy self. Admit that you have a shadowy self. I don't think it's that hard. A lot of you have been nodding your heads and getting those long faces today. We can be energized by Jesus as we leave here. We don't have a hard time knowing that we have these dark shadowy sides of us. They're always lurking. They're always following us around like a shadow does. They're always there. The only time that you don't have a shadow is when you're in complete darkness. That's like a, a real thing, like science. I think that's also but it comes to the, our soul and what we're pursuing in our life. The only time that we don't have a shadowy side is when we've given ourselves fully to that shadowy side. And by then, we've damaged ourselves so much and we've damaged people around us. The next thing that we can do is we can identify the battleground. So if there's this battle going on, according to Galatians 5.17, one of the things we can do is to try to figure out which area of our life and our shadowy side are we being tempted by. Is it about identity you want to know who you are? You're trying to figure out who you are or let people know who you are? Is it about significance that you want to be significant? Or is it about feelings? And then have this honest conversation with yourself about what's going on with the shadowy side and talk to God about it and let the shadowy side stay in the shadows and not overtake your life in your moment. And number three, feed the positive and starve the negative. So here's a way to think about this. 
Picture your shadowy self as like a mean dog, okay? Picture your Jesus-sinking, sanctified self as a good and nice dog. So you have mean dog and you have nice dog. So if you feed the mean dog, the mean dog gets strength and has power. If you feed the nice dog, the nice dog has strength, gains strength, and has power. If you get to decide on the victor, then you get to decide which dog you feed. Does that make sense? You get to decide to feed the sanctifying dog or the non-sanctifying, the shadowy side dog. There's another way to think about this. I use this a lot here. Um, you got to protect your tributaries is how I say it. I think about our heart, our soul. It's like this reservoir, and you got to protect your tributaries. you got to protect things that come into them and cut things that are bad for you off. So I'm going to use a donut analogy because donuts are important to us here at Journey. So um, you substitute donut for whatever your real shadowy side is because donuts are not evil in any way, especially ones from Donutsville, which I'm going to talk a shout-out to them. So let's say that you've decided that you want to eat more healthily. You want to eat more healthy things. You want to eat unhealthy things less frequently. So that's, um, that's a, a noble thing. That's a good thing that you can do. And let's say that on your way to work every day, you drive by donut, Donutsville. And um, they have the best fritter in the universe. If you haven't done it, it really is the best fritter in the whole universe. I haven't really been uh, off the earth um, to verify that in the universe, but I'm pretty sure that it's the best one in the universe. So if I want to eat healthy and I know that I like fritters at Donutsville and I drive by Donutsville every day and I drive through the drive through because it's really quick and it's just one fritter that's like a thousand calories, what's the big deal? I need to change my route. Does that make sense? That's what protecting your tributaries mean. If you know you have this weakness, don't feed the mean dog, the shadowy side. Feed the good side. Change your route. Change your routine. So now I have a story, uh, a personal story. I have the, the pleasure and the horror sometimes of when I get up here and teach you that God seems to give me opportunity to learn about what I teach about. Uh, I love to change. Like I said, I love that quote. But every once in a while, it just makes me a lot uncomfortable. That's what happened for me, um, to me on Saturday. And Tina got to see the whole thing. So uh, I did this little triathlon, half Ironman triathlon last Saturday. I worked really hard to train for it. It was up at Sholo. It went pretty good. I improved my time from last year. I worked really hard. It was over, and I was hungry. And so they gave the athletes, you know, the athletes are the people that work really hard to accomplish this thing. They give you these meal tickets. And there was this food truck that had really good food. So the athletes, the, one, the ones that worked really hard, they get to go and get your meal. So I went to get my meal, and the line's kind of long. And um, did I tell you I worked really hard on this? So I was a little hungry, a little hangry. You know what that word is? Angry and hungry at the same time. And I was thirsty, and I didn't bring any water. And Tina was over in this little covered area, and I was trying to get her attention so I didn't have to lose my place in line to bring me water. But she really wasn't paying any attention to me for some strange reason. And I started to learn that the volunteers were also in the line. And what these volunteers were doing, they did not do the Ironman. Did I mention that? They didn't do the Ironman, like the half Ironman that, that we did as athletes. They were in line with like 12 to 21 tickets. They were getting 21 lunches for people who were not in line and had not done the triathlon. That was unjust, in my opinion. My sense of entitlement got invaded. My sense of efficiency got invaded. And my hangry little thing started getting bigger. So there was this guy in front of me. And he yelled to his daughter, hey, give me a Dr. Pepper. And so the guy in front of him, give me one too. And so I joined in, give me one too. Ha, 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 He ignored us, and we didn't get a Dr. Pepper. That's going to be significant in a second. So after all this is taking place, I had been in line for about 10 minutes, and I noticed this lady was standing in front of me. And she wasn't standing there before. She was a cutter. I was hangry. I was thirsty. And my sense of justice got invaded even more because that's one of the worst offenses of humanity is to cut in line, especially when you're an athlete and everything. So I was nice in a business-like kind of way. And I said, are you in line? And she said, yeah. And I said, the end of the line's back here. I was nice as I told her about her error. And she said, uh, no, I've been in line. I said, I don't think you were. 
And the lady behind me, who was a volunteer, but she was behind me, so I liked her still. She <laughs> said, um, he's right. He has been standing here, and you weren't there. And so we had this little gang up thing for like <laughs> five seconds on this lady. And so she said, fine. And she moved to the back of the line, which was behind the lady behind me. <laughs> That's how, how angry I was. That's all that she moved back. And so then the line keeps going. The guy in front of me is one of those volunteers. He's getting 21 lunches. I'm trying to stay calm. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, they only got 12 as it ended up. So I got done quickly. And as I got my wonderful sandwich and I'm walking back to be with Tina, I see the cutter, the cutting lady. And the shadowy side of me took over and I just acted like I didn't see her. Isn't that what you would have done too if the shadowy side was taking over? So I was just walking past, like smiling at Tina, wanting to eat my sandwich. Well, she cut, again, she cut right in front of me and stopped me in my tracks. And she said, you are a bully. She, really, she did that. And she went on with colorful language that I would never use in public or in private, telling me the kind of person I was because of what I had done to her. And I stayed calm and very sanctified as I said to her, you cut in line. No, I didn't cut in line. You, you did cut in line. The lady behind me agreed that you cut in line. And she kept going and going and going, and I tried to stay calm. And then she said this. She said, remember when you said, I want a Dr. Pepper too? I went, oh, no, because that was when I was first in line. If she heard me say that, she was in line. I'd had these doubts wondering if she was, and I said, no, she, she wasn't. She wasn't in line. I, I have this correct. My perception is 100% accurate. And then she told me that, and I realized I was wrong. And I immediately, because I'm so noble and sanctified, I immediately apologized and said to her, I'm sorry, I made an error. Would you like my sandwich? Isn't that noble? Aren't you proud of me now? And I say these negative pastor stories, the one at the beginning, I'm way better. I didn't hire out to have her off or anything either. I offered my sandwich. I'm so noble. And so we talked a little more, and I said, I am so sorry. I really am sorry. I would have never done that. I am not a bully. I would never do that. Can we shake hands? And she said, yeah. And then I got a little weird because, you know, sometimes I, like, do the elbow thing with some of you. I said, I do this weird thing at my church. Can we, like, so we touched elbows, and it was all good. I walked back. Tina had watched the whole thing. She'd seen this woman. She's wondering why I'm getting yelled and cussed at in line. So I go back, and I tell her what happened. So I was sitting there doing what I've asked you to do. I was thinking about my shadowy side, and I was thinking about me talking to you about my shadowy side, and I was thinking Jesus for invading even a triathlon and a sandwich encounter that he wanted to sanctify me even in that moment. And I started thinking about what my problem was. I have a high sense of justice. Now, that's okay, isn't it? A high sense, God has a high sense of justice. But my high sense of justice has a shadowy side. And that shadowy side started to gain momentum as I was standing in line to get a sandwich for lunch, which really impacted my life. But it did give me a preaching uh, analogy, so we're all better for it. And I also was thinking through my identity. I was thinking about all those things and thinking that in the big scheme of things, this was not important, but I let the shadowy side take over. So I am not immune to the shadowy side. We all have these things, situations and moments that can take us over. So the challenge is, the last remedy is this. In, back in the movie, the end of the story, Jean was able to conquer her shadowy side. You know what she did? She sacrificed herself for her community. She put her community before herself. She stopped thinking about herself, and she actually gave up her life to kill the bad lead alien and to get rid of this whole power thing. Although they did do the sequel, because in the end you see like a phoenix flying in the sky, which apparently is her, so she didn't really die. But in the moment, you think she died for her community. So here's the last remedy. This is what I want us to really focus on as we leave today. The best remedy for your shadowy side is to focus on others more than on yourself. In order to not let your shadowy side that uh, does triathlons and wants fed afterwards to take the best of you and to hurt people around you, you have to put others in front of you. I am not a bully, but maybe sometimes I am. I had to realize that. So instead of furthering your identity, remind someone else of theirs. Instead of making yourself significant, remind someone else how significant they are. And instead of validating your feelings, 
validate someone else's feelings. Shift the lens off of self and on to others. At our church here at Journey, we call this reaching wider. We want to be people that reach wider, that are part of people's lives, that are friends to them, that are encouraging to them, that help people, maybe even let them cut in line in front of them. That's how we want to be as a people. That's how we want to be as a church. I want to leave you a couple of quotes. So on Tuesday morning, I was driving up to Prescott to pick up the junior hires. They had a really great camp up there. And I was thinking about this message. I was thinking about the ending, you know, how to land the plane. And I was, as I was driving north of Anthem, there was this billboard. So God talks to me to talk to you about triathlons and billboards. Isn't that cool? Isn't God efficient? So I saw this billboard and I took a picture. I went back and took a picture. So you don't think I took a picture while I'm driving because that's irresponsible and I'm, that's not me. So here's the picture. Every man must decide whether he will walk in the light of creative altruism, which just means selflessness, or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. That's Martin Luther King Jr. He was a pastor. He had a, a dark side. He did some really good things. He did some questionable things, and he did this great quote. I think that that's the epitome of where we need to go with this, is put others before ourselves. I'm pretty sure, you know, I get pretty convinced of things. I'm pretty sure that I know where he got this quote. I think he got it straight out of the Bible because he was a pastor and everything. There's this another quote that I want to show you from Philippians. The book of Philippians was a book written to a church who was trying to figure out how to live in their community. And these verses come after it says that we should imitate Jesus. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. May that be said of us. May that be so of us. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that you are transformative in our lives. That in the moments where we can be overtaken by the shadowy side as insignificant or as significant as they are, that you are still a part of those moments and you can help us win in those moments and be more like you. Help us not to dwell on our shadowy sides today as we leave here. Help us to dwell on you and how you want to change us into your likeness. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.